looking forward to another uh, content rich day today. So we will now move on to our next session, uh, which we've organized as short lightning talks. Um, we've invited a number of companies to give five minute presentations on a range of topics that will hopefully have relevance to many of you. So with that, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Colin Fay, who will take over for the session. Colin, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Colin Fay. I am a director in the private sector and investment team at the Clean Cooking Alliance. Uh, welcome to uh, a series of short lightning talks uh, where we're going to be exploring uh, the clean cooking landscape grouped by, by technology. We have 11 different presenters uh, lined up, all in fact from the Venture Catalyst portfolio that, uh, that we mentioned uh, yesterday. And, and they're going to share insights on a range of um, exciting uh, business model innovations, technologies, and market opportunities uh, that are accelerating financial sustainability and scale in the clean cooking sector. Because of the structure of this session, uh, we're not going to have a chance to address questions from the audience after every presenter, um, but the Q&A function will still be available. And if we have some time uh, at the end of the session, we can address your questions then. And if not, we'll, uh, we'll get these to the panelists to address offline. Uh, so let's get started. And first up, we have Hanan Marwa, Head of Investment and Business Development at Circle Gas. Uh, Hanan, over to you. Thanks so much, Colm. There we go. Thanks. And thanks very much also to Peter for that um, great recap. Circle Gas is the largest company selling pay-as-you-go gas in East Africa with over 15,000 customer households. We operate in Kenya, Tanzania, the UK, China, and have over 200 employees. In Kenya, we trade under the brand name MGAS. Safaricom, the leading telecom in Kenya, is our founding strategic investor, brand, and operating collaborator. We are last yard distributors of gas, and we are setting up a, local, a network of local depots to be within several kilometers of all of our customers, most of whom are currently in informal settlements. From our depots, we manage all aspects of customer service. Refills, of deli uh, refills, deliveries, call center, and technicians to solve any issues that come up. We also do, uh, when we can, uh, customer training. We are able to offer pay-as-you-go gas using our own patented smart meter, which we manufacture in China. Uh, we will have installed our own smart meters in 35,000 households over the next few months. The smart meter valve opens and lets a customer cook with gas when a customer has uploaded mobile money onto a mobile wallet and closes when funds have run out all in the, in the comfort of the customer home. We have a full suite of internally developed apps which we use to manage the system, including customer mapping, payment interface, employee training, and many others. Our customer cooking digital database keeps a record of all cooking activity and payments. We are also pioneering the use of MBIOT technology with our meters. Our product is truly pay as you cook because we install in a customer home all of the equipment needed to cook at no charge to the customer, a cylinder, stove, and smart meter, and the customer has no upfront charge or deposit. There is no leasing contract or sale of equipment. Circle Gas owns the equipment. Our aim with this model is to make gas affordable to those who cannot afford the upfront cost or deposit for a cylinder, stove, and gas refills. Our focus for growth are, is dense urban and peri-urban areas with high concent concentrations of customers. This, help, this helps keep our costs down and makes our business commercially sustainable and attractive for investors. In summary, we are a pay-as-you-go gas distributor, but we are also a full-stack software and hardware technology company producing smart meters and a logistics company with our local depots. The challenge of our business and our sector is scale and commerciality. We believe our business model solves the problem of, uh, of how, to scale, uh, how to profitably uh, scale. Um, for us, setting up individually profitable depot units in dense urban areas is critical. Customer scale also drives down the cost of our smart meter, which is already 
fallen significantly. We can afford to put our equipment in customer homes because our customers are close to us. They are within a couple of kilometers from our depots and we can easily repossess our equipment if needed. Our patented IoT smart meter in, a, in every customer home allows us to do many activities remotely and automatically with rich customer insights. Our strategic investor Safaricom adds a range of services and brand value and helps us to overcome the operational challenges to expansion, as well as understands our customer very well. This is exciting because it's a digital business model, developing a long-term financial and customer service relationship with customers with unique distribution capabilities, where there's often little formal sector distribution. It is exciting because we know our customers are able to stop stacking with other fuels because our solution is cheaper and they don't need to save money towards buying refills of gas. Its scale opens the door to very different investor pools than has previously been available to clean cooking. Our business model is capital intensive, but rewarding with a long-term revenue stream and a scalable fuel and operating model. Thank you very much. Thanks, Hanan. Um, sticking yeah, uh, with- just <laughs> click past those. That's fine. Thanks so much. Uh, stick, sticking with the LPG space, we're going to turn it over to uh, Philippe uh, Hoblick, uh, founder and CEO of Paygas. Uh, Philippe, over to you and uh, just let us know when you want us to advance the slides. Thank you, Colm. I, I don't know if you can hear me. Yep. Right. Thank you, Colm, very much. So, yes, if you can go to the next slide. So, I'm Philippe. I'm the, the co-founder and the CEO of Pegas. Pegas it disrupts the traditional all-source cooking gas access by adjusting the quantity of gas delivered through a cashless refilling station and proprietary technology pay as you guess. So the main uh, technology of Pegas is uh, on a cashless refilling station, like a petrol station, but for gas. And um, it has been designed uh, with the safest standards, uh, international standards, approved by major company like Linda Group, Rubis Energy. It's a cashless, totally cashless solution and inclusive, meaning that you go at the Pegas station near, near the corner, you pay with your, your, your cashless solution and it feels exactly the amount that you pay for. You can pay for less than 50 cents. Uh, next slide. So we address the, the, the problem of, of um, the access to energy uh, by looking on the problem of clients. So the cooking uh, low income problem is they're using um, wood, charcoal, paraffin, electricity, expensive electricity, uh, because they can't afford to buy a full cylinders every time it's empty. And you don't know when it will be empty and regardless the size of the cylinder. But why is it the situation is we, the gas company is asking you to buy a full cylinder because they got the massive costs. They got massive costs on the LPG chain. Uh, they got massive costs on, on getting client, for example, to get one client like Colm, and it about four cylinders permanently blocked in rotation to be able to save him at, at any time. So this, this massive capex um, is making this entry barrier. So with the solution of Pegas, we, 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 we completely disrupt this entry barrier of a full cylinders every time it's empty. Next slide. So what is Pegas? Pegas is the largest energy inclusion scalable solution for the maximum impact. With $1, you can have one kg of, 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 of LPG. You can have with $1, 10 mils. So it's easy like this. It's um, I will respect my client. I will not force him to buy minimum quantity or to end up to, 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 to pay for the gas. I will just respect what he got in his pocket. You got $1, you got $1, you got $2, you got $2. So it's a real prepaid model. If, if you don't have the money, you don't go at the station. But if you got the minimum, we can serve you. So it's accessible. It's two kilometers walking distance, hyperlocal, safety. It's very important. It has been certified by Angie. Uh, NG by, by Rubis Energy, by, by, by uh, Linda Group. It's economic inclusion. We deploy on the franchise model. We create not employment, we create entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs will run the business uh, on a profit sharing model and, and, and we'll, we'll create jobs inside community. They've been approved by South African public authorities with one of the highest standards and regulated um, um, country regarding LPG in Africa. And, and we are creating cost synergy with, with our gas partners. So the business model of Pegas is based on cost saving for gas company. So we can reduce CapEx and OPEX by massive amount and to, 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 to deploy with existing gas company. Next slide. 
So what did, do we do? We, we, we started 18 months ago uh, with one pilot. Uh, we, we did, um, we did uh, then we scale up to two, two, two stations. So in 18 months, we got three stations. We sold 100 tons of LPG, 5,000 monthly client, 200,000 beneficiary. Uh, get it, get it, being putting the, the model to be profitable with only six members in the team. And thanks to this success, we won major award from Angie Clean Cooking, uh, Smart City, a uh, sustainable uh, solution from, from Cape Town. And now we're deploying three stations and, and, and 21 in next year with Pick and Pay, with a massive retail store in South Africa, who, who likes the fact that when you go at, this, at your shop, you want to, to buy your you, you, you cooking energy on the same time. So we are scaling up, we are deploying on the, on the national level at the moment in South Africa. Next slide. So, and, and last slide for, for, for the audience. So call for action. Um, we're we are looking for, for um, a phase two deployment with, with a pick and pay, uh, meaning deploying 100 Pega station, cashless Pega station, uh, and, 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 and getting also we get interest from other country in Africa. So we, are, we want also to deploy Pegas in some West African country, Nigeria, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, Burkina Faso, Mali, Togo, Benin, and, and also East Africa. So that's the next step for Pegas is moving from national South Africa level to uh, a continental one. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Philippe. Um, we're switching now to, to biofuels and, and what we're including uh, here are, are uh, fuels processed uh, biomass such as pellets and, and, and briquettes as, as well as ethanol. And we're going to start with uh, 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 Otago. Carlo from, from uh, Cambodia is with us. Uh, so Carlo Figa Talamanca is the CEO of Otago. Uh, and uh, over to you. Um, Hello, uh, thank you, Colm, and hello, everyone. Good to see also some fellow entrepreneurs like Miha and uh, Ruben and Peter, which I haven't seen uh, for a year, practically, in these strange times. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, the quality of the product uh, for a very special market niche. Uh, in my case, of course, we produce uh, charcoal or chabriquettes. Uh, environmental friendly chabriquettes. They are, of course, uh, sustainable for the environment and produce uh, less emissions than normal charcoal. But um, we are going, I think I want to talk about the sector, which I think is the most undervalued and underrated sector uh, in our clean cooking sector. Next slide, please. And this sector is um, the street food, small eateries, and restaurants. Uh, I see in our clean cooking sector, there's always talks about households and there's talks about institutional cooking, like big schools or hospitals or whatever. But actually, uh, street food is one of the main um, food sources for the population. There's street food everywhere uh, during, the night, the, during the day and during the night. There's, for example, in front of factories, in front of construction sites, in front of schools, also near our factory, we have a, a several street food where I eat, and then where, of course, they use my chabriquettes. And um, these are sort of uh, perfect customers because, first of all, they have money because uh, they they have a business, so they have money to to pay for fuel or uh, stove eventually. And also they buy big quantities. And yesterday I heard they talking about distribution as an issue. They buy big quantities because they cook a lot. Next slide, please. Uh, what is um, important in the sector, I think is, uh, however, you need to know it very well because it is a, a very difficult sector. I said they're everywhere, they buy big quantities, they have money. But first of all, there are professionals. They are experts. And I put here um, a picture of Anthony Bourdain. I believe a lot of you know him. And he was going and talking to street food vendors around the world and getting to know how they cook, what they cook. And um, they don't care about aspirational factor of fuel or stoves. They care about the fact that your fuel ha has to be good uh, value for money their fuel has to fit to their business in terms of the value that they get from the fuel, from your fuel or your stove, and also, of course, uh, the cost of it. 
and also they are very demanding customers because there's they, they cook so many different things but first of all they cook all day long or some of them they cook all night long there's uh, night uh, people that work at night they some of them cook really fast some cook really slow some uh, uh, use the fuel to warm up dishes some use the fuel to keep the dishes warm all day long uh, they uh, some of them just serve one customer at a time or they serve a, a um, for example, factory workers coming out of their working shift. So they are very, or some of them, they actually do all of this together. And uh, yesterday they were talk, they talk about like maybe it's not like having to overcome the barrier of stove stacking. I've seen most of these kitchens, they stack stoves, they use electric cooking for the rice, they use uh, LPG for stir fry, they use charcoal for uh, steaming, for boiling, for soups. So they, they have very um, um, yeah, particular needs. And then next slide, please. We can see what uh, what do you gain by uh, being able to serve this sector. First of all, this sector is gigantic. You, they get they are everywhere, and as I said, they have money and they buy big quantities. Uh, if you are able to serve them, uh, that means also actually, I here in our sector we talk a lot, a lot about women. Uh, sometimes we talk about women, women entrepreneurship in our sector, uh, companies led uh, very well by women. But in this case, we are going to improve the women livelihood because these micro businesses, uh, street food is all usually women running their family business. So by uh, finding a, a better fuel for them, they, you are going to improve the livelihood of women and therefore really their income and their quality of life, not only by providing a cleaner cooking solution. And uh, last but not least, actually it is, there's a marketing effect. Uh, they cook on the street and a lot of people that I talk to that maybe don't, haven't, uh, don't buy my char briquettes uh, directly, they say, oh, I've seen it somewhere on street food or in a restaurant. So practically by giving it to people that uh, do professional cooking, by uh, selling it to them, you have a marketing effect by potential customers that can see your product, get aware of it, see that it's actually working well because they eat the delicious uh, food that uh, they buy in those restaurants or facilities and eateries. And so, yeah, you even have a fantastic marketing effect. Thank you very much. That's all from me. Great, thanks, Carlo. Uh, next up, we have uh, Greg Murray, uh, co-founder and CEO of Coco Networks. Uh, Greg, are you with us? Yes, I am. Hi. Fantastic. Hi, Greg. Uh, and over to you. Thanks. Uh, let me try the stopwatch. Right. Um, if we kick off, so so Coco uh, is a technology company um, that is based in. Uh, in Kenya and India. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Um, sorry, am I driving these or? Yeah, there we are. Uh, maybe the next one. Uh, basically about 700 staff. And what we do uh, is uh, we've built a technology platform for low cost, ultra clean cooking through liquid ethanol. Uh, we are uh, the, the network operator in Kenya uh, using our technologies which are consumer hardware, last mile, last mile fuel, fuel distribution technologies, and a range of software. We have our own uh, in-house factory in, in, in Gujarat in India. Uh, next slide. Um, if you're thinking about solving the dirty fuels challenge, um, you, you need to really think about four key pillars that apply to any new energy, energy industry, whether it's solar, wind, coal-fired power, or indeed, uh, LPG or ethanol, you need customized infrastructure, customized tech, institutional capital, and, and customized policy. So that's the framing through which we've approached this dirty fuels challenge from the outset. We're about six years old as a company. Uh, next slide. And one of the nice things about um, ethanol as a solution is that you don't have to build the upstream, the midstream, or the retail infrastructure. Um, there is a very large global market for ethanol. It's very deep. Um, and so like, like our friends in the pellet space are finding, uh, it's quite difficult to build upstream and downstream at the same time. There's also tens of billions of dollars worth of liquid fuels infrastructure for un uncompressed liquids, petrol, diesel, kerosene, that can actually be utilized in a drop-in manner for this, this fourth line of liquid fuel. And of course, there's the small shops where all FMCG products are sold from. So when we set out 
the, the company, we said, well, really what we need to try and solve for is how to get uncompressed flammable liquid from a small depot called a petrol station into small shops where everybody buys all their, their basic FMCG needs. Um, that was the, the basic thesis. We need to play this connective role through technology and solve for a technology and commercial API into the existing large scale production and distribution space for uncompressed flammable liquids. Uh, uh, moving to the next slide. Um, so how it works is that we partner with the downstream fuels industry. In the case of Kenya, we awarded a 10 year wholesale concession to Vivo Energy, which is the Shell licensee after a shootout with multiple downstream companies. So this fuel is stored in dedicated tanks underneath Shell stations that have a piece of cocoa hardware called a smart depot system on them. There is a fleet of small micro tankers that have a piece of cocoa hardware on the back called a smart tanker system that do the last mile milk run to a dense network of automated fuel dispensers. We call them cocoa points. They're fuel ATMs that uh, have a dozen sensors inside sending stuff, uh, sending uh, heartbeats to our cloud. And of course we do the consumer hardware, the stove and canister. And then we do the software that controls the flow of money, data, fuel appliances. Uh, and so that's now operating at, at, at very large scale in the uh, greater Nairobi metropolitan area. Uh, next slide. Uh, and uh, basically the, uh, the, the end result is um, a solution that is fast. So it's, it's, it's the same heat output as LPG. Um, it's, it's as clean from a particular emissions perspective as LPG in the end use, but of course it's a lot cleaner from an emissions perspective because there's no upstream methane emissions and leakage around LPG as, as, as is the case. Um, it's very easy. It's a lot safer than LPG. It's a lot safer than charcoal and kerosene. Um, and, and it's been proven and it's scaling very rapidly in Nairobi. The end result from a consumer perspective is 50% cheaper than charcoal. And it's, it's, it's less than half the price of the equivalent LPG solution. Um, and so it's something that, that, um, that, that, that finally after about years and years of work, we launched about a year ago and has uh, started to scale uh, rapidly. We're establishing the category, people understand the brand and, and, and that word of mouth is happening. Um, next slide. Uh, the, uh, some pictures here. This is our 70,000 square foot factory. We're doubling that. Um, we've, we've, uh, next door, there's been a, an equal size uh, facility that we're taking the lease on uh, in two weeks to, to triple the production capacity. Uh, we built that in house. Uh, next slide. Um, and there's some pictures of, uh, of uh, our Nairobi operations. So we run a network operation center like a telco call center, our own fleet of trucks. We make the high tech stuff in Nairobi um, uh, at, a, at, a, at a technology production facility we have there. Next slide. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, yeah, basically to give a sense of the scale, 10 stations, 10 micro tankers at present, 700 of these fuel ATMs uh, providing coverage to about 12% of Kenyans. Um, that's about 6 million Kenyans. Um, Dolberg did a study independently funded two years ago that found that the system-wide capex of our solution versus LPG is about 1 18th. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's quite low cost, relatively speaking, to, to scale the supply side. And of course, on the demand side, there is no government subsidies and there is no subprime consumer credit. As you know, it's quite easy to write a loan. It's quite hard to collect. So we don't do uh, consumer financing quite intentionally. We don't need to. Um, next slide. Uh, uh, we produce uh, credits because of the positive impact of switching from uh, eth uh, from charcoal to ethanol. We use those credits to uh, to to provide the customer um, uh, uh, with with lower prices, uh, which speeds up the adoption. So so you know the clean development mechanism uh, working as 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 designed um, through our business. Um, and that's a, that's a real advantage, obviously, because of the sustainability profile of ethanol as a renewable fuel versus alternatives. Uh, next slide. Uh, we are rolling out in the rest of Kenya um, starting next year. We've started production on the cocoa points. We'll be taking from about 700 to about 3,000. Uh, and we will be uh, starting the process next year of doing the early stage development to enable us to launch networks in the near abroad and in, in other East African countries in 2022 onwards. Uh, and then we'll be starting the lobbying process in, in another four countries next year to enable us to start the development process to enable us to launch the, the year after. So it's a, it's, it's a aggressive expansion plans, but we, we think that fundamentally um, over time uh, we'll be in dozens of countries and, and that this will be a material um, uh, uh, segment of the cooking energy market and solve the cooking fuel uh, uh, problem, the dirty cooking fuel challenge in a really material way. Investment wise, um, 
We've raised purely commercial capital um, over many, many rounds, over many, many years. We recently closed the Series C. We're not seeking capital uh, at, at present, not seeking equity. And, uh, uh, and, and, and so the main ask is really, and the reason that, uh, that I'm happy to, to, to collaborate with the Clean Cooking Alliance folks is to, is to really just show what, we, what we're doing and, and, and to enter discussions with folks that seek to joint venture or partner with us for markets in new, uh, in, in, in new, in new countries where we can put our own capital to work uh, in partnership with others that, that, that perhaps have better operating experience in their, in their backyards. That's the approach we're taking for geographic expansion. Uh, right, I'll pause there. Wonderful, thanks so much, Greg. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, Matthias Olson. Matthias is the co-founder and CEO uh, of Emerging Cooking Solutions. Uh, Matthias, over to you. Yes, hello. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Great. So I want to talk to you about uh, pellets, about biomass pellets, um, and I want to frame it in the context of uh, what I see now is kind of the price, which is really uh, to find a way to reach uh, really um, all the people that needs clean cooking. And uh, if you can move to the next slide, please. So um, I called it the bedrock of uh, clean cooking. And um, I want to frame it in terms of the SDG, SDG 7, um, which is talking about uh, uh, affordable, reliable, sustainable, modern um, access for all. Um, and. Um, I want to frame it in that way because um, I think now there is a lot of innovation in clean cooking and it's really good to see. When I started uh, 10 years ago, uh, when we started uh, Emerging Cooking Solutions 2012, everyone was talking about uh, cooking stoves and even uh, it was Global Lines for Clean Cook Stoves. It wasn't Clean Cooking Alliance. It's been a shift in the past few years, uh, which is very positive, I think, um, where people are looking at not only the stoves, but also the, the fuel as well and the entire solution, including distribution and technology and Pago and so on. And that's very positive. Um, but I think we have to challenge ourselves to look even further now and really think about um, how can we reach uh, not only the, uh, the kind of people who are the first to be able to afford clean cooking. Um, how can we really uh, reach um, this goal. And um, I think we also have to frame it in terms of climate change. Um, I think it's important and I'm not saying that one technology is for all and so on. Um, I think there are good technologies for everyone, but I think the sector hasn't really uh, understood uh, where, how we can solve really the for all part of SDG 7. And um, uh, I think it's also uh, good to acknowledge that uh, charcoal and, and firewood really are not more than fuels. Uh, uh, and I think there is a transition uh, technology, uh, but I think if we really want to achieve something that is uh, really all of these things, um, I think we have to really think deeper. So we can move to next slide. Uh, and I actually set it up as uh, it was going to come in bit by bit. But uh, this is a picture from 1921. This is a great movie. It's a Charlie Chaplin movie called The Kid. Uh, and uh, he is a tramp. He's one of the lowest uh, income, presumably, in the society in America. And he has a Pago uh, utility cooking solution. Uh, that's a gas meter. He's to uh, telling the kid to put um, um, money in the gas meter. Uh, so this is 100 years ago. And they had kind of a utility scale solution. So what I think we have to do now, you know, now we've come from cooking stoves to cooking solutions or looking at fuel as well. Um, the sector is not really looking at um, uh, sufficiently at, uh, uh, at kind of looking at, at utility solutions. I know companies like we've heard in the previous presentations are doing that, uh, but it's, ver it's very much about thinking of it like, um, still like um, individual solutions. And I think we can take the next slide. Uh, so coming to pellets then, um, first of all, um, many uh, people um, often think that the pellets are actually burning, uh, but they are not, they're actually gasifying. Uh, and that's an important distinction because when pellets gasify, uh, 
the gases um, are released and they're actually burning in a very controlled and efficient way. So the result is really, uh, really amazing. And uh, why I think um, pellets has a real uh, value to become the base fuel for uh, clean cooking is, first of all, if we look at it macroeconomically, um, fuel pellets can be made domestically. It can be made from a variety of biomass. Um, we have published peer-reviewed research on uh, in Zambia where we work on um, um, more than 10 different uh, waste biomass that uh, produced excellent uh, pellets. Uh, and that's important because the country can then become self-sufficient um, in pellets um, eventually. Um, and it's also, um, of course, the whole um, sustainability in the entire life cycle is really important because you might have a clean cooking solution, but you want the whole cycle to be really clean. And uh, pellets has a real uh, high potential to do that. I mean, we, for example, we produce pellets from uh, forestry waste from plantations. Um, and there is a large potential for further te technology development in the pellet sector. Uh, we really are at the second generation. First generation was uh, natural draft and second generation was forced air. But there hasn't been very much technology development in this sector. Um, and the key point is that if we look cost at cost per cooking hour, um, pellets is really standing out as being, uh, um, I would say, uh, the cheapest per cooking hour um, or one of the absolute uh, cheapest. Uh, and that is important to reach the for all part um, because otherwise we will pick the top 10, 20 percent, uh, but it's hard to reach um, all the way to everyone. Uh, and also the investment costs are not um, as substantial as with some others. Um, so we can move to the other slide. Uh, so, uh, I mean, the challenge is, I think um, um, one of the challenge is actually the perception that uh, gasification of pellets uh, is seen as uh, biomass, is, is, is seen as uh, basically slightly better than burning uh, firewood. Um, and it's a totally different thing. Um, I mean, a good pellet gasifier has uh, an incredible heat, um, has a uh, possibility to really cook food really fast, and you can have a good range uh, of cooking. And it's it's very cheap. And um, it's tier four, even tier five level. Um, so um, I think um, what we also see is that uh, the pioneer companies um, such as ourselves and in Inieri. I mean, we both started in landlocked countries. Uh, I think uh, in hindsight, it would have been better to start in a, uh, in a not in a landlocked country and, and import pellets. I think that's what uh, really would be uh, the way to um, for other companies to um, to move forward with, with new models, because um, that allows you to push the CapEx cost down further. Um, and also, Making pellets, I can speak from my own experience, it's a huge undertaking. And it really is a, uh, it's something that um, if you don't start uh, with a kind of uh, capacity of a, of a well-founded company, uh, it takes a long time and you have to make a lot of uh, mistakes and so on, um, which we have gone through. And we now have a, uh, one of the biggest pellet uh, factories in Africa, um, fuel pellet factories in Africa. Uh, and also, I think another challenge is the, I mean, the closure of Ingenieria. I'm sure most people know um, about, you know, uh, the high profile um, company in Ingenieri. Uh, I didn't say failure. Uh, I really don't think it was a failure. Um, I call it closure. I think Ingenieri uh, pushed a lot of things and um, made some really uh, amazing results. Um, and like uh, most forerunners, um, they're, they are, have to take a, a lot of the challenges on their shoulders. Uh, but um, um, I do think that um, it's important that the sector is, is um, looking at uh, the achievements of engineering also and, and uh, that the uh, sector doesn't become um, cynical. Um, so my prediction is really that in the next few years, uh, we're going to see um, Pellet emerge as a um, uh, really strong and viable alternative to the base fuel. Because as I mentioned in the beginning, um, I think there is now um, a variety of the five or so clean fuels. Uh, all are developing new solutions and, and showing um, their potential in different ways. Uh, but I really think that um, more and more is going to show that um, pellets really has the pos 
potential to become um, uh, the base fuel for, for clean cooking. So um, I think that's what I had to say. Great, thank you so much, Matthias. Mm -hmm. Um, next, we're going to switch to, to biogas, and we're going to hear from Vijay Bhopal. Uh, Vijay is the Managing Director of Connected Energy. Uh, and over to you, Vijay. Thanks a lot, uh, Colin. Great to be here. Uh, next slide, please. So just to introduce Connected Energy, uh, we're only about two years old. And we're a team of 15 at the moment, mainly technical people, developers, engineers, and some energy access professionals like myself. I've been working in renewable energy and energy access for a decade. Um, and we make smart metering technologies, both for solar PV and for biogas. So that picture there is our cloud solar smart meter for uh, DC electricity applications. Next slide, please. But obviously today I'm talking about biogas. Uh, this is a, an example of a, of a biogas digester that we've got our uh, biogas smart meter, which is simply called smart, smart biogas connected to. Next slide, please. So first thing to say about biogas is that everybody who works in biogas really loves it and believes in it as a technology solution. And I think that's it's for several reasons, but the, the main one that I see is that it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful circular economy technology. And it's got really important co-benefits for, for farmers that use it. However, it does have higher maintenance needs than other cooking technologies. And I think people um, are, are, uh, accept that. And th therefore the biogas sector faces some issues. Uh, first, there is a, a lack of real-time monitoring of biogas digesters at the moment. Uh, secondly, the operational costs in the sector tend to be quite high. And that means that there's lots of room for utilization of, of data to optimize operations and unlock things like, like pay-as-you-go. These charts on the right-hand side are from um, some research that we've been undertaking with a third party in Kenya. And I won't go into the detail, but the basics is that uh, biogas companies spend more money than you might think um, maintaining their digesters. That's, that's what that chart at the top shows. And the second thing is that there is a quite a strong desire and demand for smart technologies in the biogas sector. Next slide, please. So this is what the, the product looks like. Uh, this the a fairly basic looking smart meter and it's installed inside customers houses in the kitchen near to the stove connected to the gas pipe and just out of shot underneath the the green box is a venturi meter uh, which measures pressure and gas flow in the in the gas pipe next slide please so the smart biogas usp is that we have developed patent pending techniques for both biogas flow and pressure sensing. And we're within 3% accuracy on each now, which um, I think I'm, I'd be right in saying is, uh, is more accurate than, than you can get elsewhere in the market. The data that we collect unlocks pay as you go on a service basis rather than an asset payment basis as uh, Ben uh, explain, ben from ATEC was explaining yesterday, so it's different to that. Um, and it also has the potential to unlock cheaper and more accurate greenhouse gas abatement reporting. Next slide, please. However, <clears throat> arguably an even more important use of the real-time data is for operational insights and diagnostics. We're working on an analytics platform at the moment, um, and we can use digester data to tell us about users' cooking patterns, and also when excess gas is building up and venting to the atmosphere. In our research so far, we found that users tend not to think that they have excess gas in their digesters, but in almost all cases, they actually do. And the example shown in this chart, it shows venting of excess methane throughout much of the night. And that's shown in, in with, with the orange color and even at one point during the day. This means that digesters are either oversized or underutilized. 
and could provide extra income to the users if they were able to bottle or bag that excess gas and sell it. So these are the kinds of insights that we're getting through our analytics platform and we're, build, we're building a, a suite of services for biogas companies uh, through the using the data that we collect. Next slide, please. Uh, so what? Well, biogas is still a relatively manual technology. I think people recognize that. And uh, smart biogas offers an accurate sensing methodology for biogas. Digitization and data insights, insights allow charging customers for what they actually use. Um, it also has the potential to reduce operational costs and give biogas companies valuable insights into digestive health and use. And it also has the potential to offer more accurate carbon reporting. And I really believe that the role of ICT in biogas is going to be even more important than the role of ICT has been in off-grid solar. Next slide, please. So we have pilots, pilots ongoing in Uganda, Kenya, UK, Nigeria, and we're doing a few more countries and lots more activities soon. The next, next country will be India. And we're working on remote control and venting control functionality for a future release. And that's that, that we hope that that will be next year. And we're also working with gold standard and clean development mechanism to incorporate smart biogas into their processes so that any biogas company can use it for their carbon reporting. So thanks a lot for the invite today and hopefully that was a decent insight into what we're up to. Thanks a lot. Great, thanks so much Vijay. Uh, sticking with biogas, next up we have uh, Esther Altorfer. Uh, Esther is the Managing Director uh, for East Africa at Sistema Bio. Uh, so take it away, Esther. Great. Uh, hi, good afternoon, um, everybody. And, and thank you for the Clean uh, Cooking Alliance for, for the invitation and come for organizing this session. Uh, thanks, Vijay, for, for introducing some of the, the challenges that we're facing in the biogas sector. I'll be speaking today about um, Sistema Bio and how we uh, uh, work towards uh, addressing all of uh, or most of those challenges. So next slide. Okay, so sorry, I think there's a small lag, uh, but I'll, I'll work with that. So um, I'm, I'm Esther, Managing Director of System of Bio in East Africa. We at System of Bio, we exist because um, we've realized that over 80% of the food in developing economies is grown by small farmers who um, disproportionately lack access to technology, capacity building, and financing to improve their productivity, efficiency, and sustainability. Next one, please. Um, in parallel to, to facing those, those challenges, um, farmers um, also um, face a high economic health and environmental cost um, due to their lack of waste management system, high cost of energy, and unsustainable agricultural inputs. Next one, please. What this basically means for, for Sistema Bio is uh, we exist because our vision is to build a sustainable, equitable, and empathetic world without waste. And our mission is to create value um, from this waste. So this is um, why, why we're here today, and I'm really excited to, to present this uh, to you. Next one, please. Um, so far, uh, we've uh, started operations over 10 years ago in Mexico um, and uh, progressively expanded to South America, East Africa, and India. We have installed close to 20,000 biodigesters um, so far, and they we're installing a new system of biodigester roughly every three hours uh, on all of those uh, regions in the world. Next one, please. And um, this is just a, an overview of the product. Um, so you, what you can see in the bottom is our, our biodigester, which receives the waste input every single day in the inlet tank, um, which is mixed with water. 
Uh, it goes into the biodigester system where uh, a biologic process of anaerobic digestion takes place and produces biogas. Um, we include in our basic package the single burner cooker and double burner cooker, which are our very basic clean cooking services that we offer to 100% of our clients. We also have larger appliances uh, to run agricultural equipment uh, on the farm. The, the second byproduct from the biodigester is the biofertilizer, um, which is a nutrient-rich organic fertilizer that can be applied directly uh, on the field, uh, pr pr contributing to uh, organic farming and sustainable agriculture. Our product is prefabricated. Um, it's extremely durable. It's resist to UV. Uh, we provide a warranty for 10 years, and uh, the, the biodigester has a lifespan of at least 20 years. It's extremely e easy to install. It takes less than one day uh, for most of our sizes. Um, we have a wide diversity of sizes of biodigester that adapt to um, the different farm types. So we work with small subsistence farmers uh, who have two to three cows, as well as larger farms that have uh, up to 20 or more cows. Um, and we can grow together with those farms. So if they were to um, add more cows, uh, we could, our systems are modular and we can add capacity to, to the existing installation. Um, very importantly, VJ mentioned maintenance is, is expensive uh, in biogas. Uh, I'm not going to uh, deny that, but our biodigesters are built for the most easy, uh, the easiest maintenance um, possible to really make the, the whole product user friendly. Uh, and we work a lot on training our, our clients in order to make this easy and affordable. Next one, please. And beyond our, our clean cooking stove, which you can see on the top left here, uh, which is our spider stove, we have developed a wide range of biogas appliances, a family of products to really meet all of the farmer's energy and fertilizer needs, which range from biogas for cooking, for heating of larger volumes with, with the industrial burners and water heater, as well as uh, other farm appliances like generator, milking machines, and, and other um, chaff cutters and, and engines um, to really offer a complete package to all of our clients. Next one, please. And most importantly, beyond the product, uh, so we offer, uh, we really combine those high quality biogas products with a complete set of services and financing packages so that we can guarantee value for our clients. Um, so what you can see in the, in the left chart here is that we, we offer the technology, uh, which um, is our own product design, our own IP, our own manufacturing, which is ISO 9001 certified. Uh, we offer the full installation service and training uh, to every single one of our clients. Um, and we offer uh, asset financing solutions uh, to provide payment plans of up to 24 months to all of our clients in order to reduce um, the, the barrier, the initial barrier to access uh, the biodigester. All of this is managed by our digital um, data management platform, uh, which tracks every single interaction with the client, as well as the repayment system. Next one, please. And this is just a, a, an example of a typical uh, smallholder farmer cash flow. Um, before uh, they invest in a biodigester, you can see the status quo on the, on the left side where they spend uh, around 30 to 50% of their revenue in uh, energy uh, and chemical fertilizer before investing in a biodigester. Once they invest throughout the repayments period, they have a fixed payment plan every month. Um, and after having reimbursed their loan, maximum two years after the, the biodigester is installed, um, they are going to perceive pure savings for at least 18 years of the lifetime. So what you can see in the bottom in this table is that basically this is an extremely profitable investment for any single farmer because the payback time uh, is extremely fast. Uh, so we're really able to match almost, uh, to almost match the, the monthly expense in 
energy and fertilizer uh, with the monthly payment plan to equalize them to have a zero sum game. And then once the loan is paid, um, we can, um, uh, well, they will basically only perceive benefits. Uh, next one, please. We track all of this uh, through our mobile data platform and our backend CRM. Uh, so we can track the customer experience over time. Uh, everything is integrated from our technicians in the field, uh, like Robert, that you can see on the left here, um, through from the point of lead generation to the sale, to the actual installation, all the after sales service, um, plus all the customer service and other interactions. Um, that take place with, with the client throughout uh, throughout their, their time with the biodigester. Next one, please. Um, we have boots on the ground. So we have um, teams, a committed and passionate team uh, in, uh, in over four countries uh, that, that is working hard to uh, deliver impact and change small farmers' lives. So we have offices in, in Mexico, Colombia, Kenya, and India um, with uh, a really dedicated team of sales agents and technicians who, who work uh, to, to raise awareness of our biodigesters every single day. Next one, please. And this is, um, so far, as I had mentioned, we uh, have installed uh, over 20,000 biodigesters and we're looking to grow. Uh, this, this success has been um, uh, so far achieved through, through the hard work of our team um, and also for partnerships. Um, we're not currently fundraising, but we are looking for partners who work uh, in, in similar, um, with similar profiles of farmers or who are interested in improving access to the cleanest of the cooking fuel is how I like to refer to, to biogas. Um, uh, so feel free to, to contact me, uh, next one, please, if you're interested in, uh, in having some further conversations on how we can work together. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks so much, Esther. Uh, and uh, staying with biogas again, we're going to uh, go over to Lachlan Harris. Uh, Lachlan is the lead engineer for ATEC Biodigesters International. Uh, so, Lucky, over to you. Yeah, uh, thanks, Colin. Um, yeah, I'm the lead engineer with ATEC. Uh, yeah, my name's Lucky Harris. I'm based out of Australia. Um, so, ATEC is an Australian owned uh, social enterprise. So, we've operated in Cambodia since 2015. And in 2020, we started operations in Bangladesh. Um, next slide. Uh, so we manufacture and sell biodigesters um, to small scale farmers. So generally who own around two to four cows. So quite small scale. Um, our biodigesters are prefabricated, made from LLDPE, which is um, a type of plastic similar to what uh, your ice boxes or some kayaks are made from. Um, and they take around two to three hours to install. Um, as part of our biodigester package, we provide a, a double biogas stove and a, a biogas rice cooker to customers. Next slide. Um, so yeah, today I uh, want to present and talk to you about um, something we've implemented over the last two years in regards to um, financing. So systems in Cambodia cost around $700. Um, this means the majority of Cambodian farmers need access to finance. Uh, now, microfinance exists in Cambodia, obviously, and is quite prevalent. However, the, the terms of microfinance loans can be quite onerous. So they either need really high existing asset or cash requirements. They need often high, very high interest rates and then, um, yeah, really onerous collateral requirements. So for a $700 loan, for example, people might be required to put down their land title, um, which is, you know, can be quite a a deterrent or a block for someone to enter into a microfinance loan. So ATEC wanted to find a way to remove this block um, in our sales and for customers to get a biodigester. Um, and we wanted to yeah, offer instalment payments to make biodigesters more accessible for customers. Next slide. So ATEC now offer uh, finance direct to our customers um, via our patented biogas pay system. 
So how this works is ATEC actually enter direct into an, a credit agreement with customers. Um, so these uh, credit agreements have really simple monthly repayment amounts. There's no interest, there's no collateral, there's really simple credit approval processes and really simple, easy um, payments made via mobile money. So no one has to go to their customer's house to collect cash. Um, it's all yeah, very simple and straightforward for customers. Next slide. Uh, so the way we do this is um, we've partnered with a high quality manufacturing partner um, and then also in Gaza, who I think most of us know are leaders in the Paygo space, particularly in solar. Uh, so we've developed uh, what we call our Biogas Paygo box, which you can see in the photo here, um, one of our staff members um, entering a code into. So each customer uh, receives a unique ID, which is assigned to every specific Paygo box. Um, they then use those IDs to make payments via mobile money. Um, and these payments are then recognised in Ingaza via integration uh, with the mobile money provider. Uh, customers then receive um, an SMS every time they make a payment and with a key code and they enter that key code into their biogas box and that then um, provides them gas. If they uh, are late or for whatever reason, then there's a valve inside the box that will shut off the gas supply. Um, so ATEC monitor late payments in the Ingaza hub and then um, through that hub, we implement our late payment processes. Next slide. So on average, we actually see that um, a biodigester in Cambodia can um, increase uh, a farmer's income by around $43 per month. Now, this could be through a variety of things, including savings on chemical fertilizer, savings on cooking fuel like LPG, or even purchasing um, charcoal or firewood, as well as increases in crop yield and uh, time saved, and then uh, additional income with that time they've saved. So. With our biodigesting um, biogas, sorry, uh, Pago in Cambodia generally being around thirty dollars per month, um, the biodigesters actually can be cash positive even during the repayment period, and then obviously once they're repaid, they um, become even more cash positive. Next slide. So some secondary benefits we see um, from Pago besides obviously making um, the biodigesters more accessible is. It's very easy for us to roll out uh, sales promotions. So for example, try before you buy or first two or three months free, um, or also uh, referrals um, for customers who refer, refer customers. We can either take money off their loan um, quite easily or even give them like a grace period of a month. Um, we can offer different payment plans very easily through the Ingaza hub. Um, to suit specific customers financial situations. So um, we can offer, yeah, monthly repayment amounts that suit um, certain customers. And then we also have the capacity to easily modify payment plans um, during times of financial hardship. And this has been particularly important in you know, 2020 with COVID and a lot of garment factories, for example, in Cambodia are shutting down. Um, garment factory workers provide a lot of um, income to you know, overall families. And then with, with that income gone, um, repayments have been more difficult and we've been able to very easily um, help customers out in you know, the short term where their um, income has, has decreased due to those garment factories shutting. Next slide. So yeah, just some of the key points from our Pago. So we've been selling on Pago for about the last 18 months. Um, so we now see in Cambodia that 92% of our sales are, are through Pago. Um, we still offer cash sales, but yeah, 92% of people want to be on a payment plan. We have the maximum churn rate we've seen over the last 18 months is 2%, which is uh, very low. So solar Pago is on average around 15% in that sector. Um, the average portfolio at risk um, over the last 18 months, um, so portfolio at risk of more than seven days overdue is around 2.2%, which is also extremely low. So those two metrics um, sh indicate quite a healthy portfolio. And um, in terms of like repossessions, we've done, you know, very few. Um, so Pago has been quite a success for ATEC. Um, so we've secured around $350,000 in debt funding thus far to fund our, our Pago um, credit uh, loans. And we've got 600,000 uh, further committed um, in term sheets. So the 
the biogas paygo product um, has the potential to be rolled out in other countries to other companies, um, either under a licensing or wholesale arrangement, um, and you know has the potential to assist any biogas company with making their products more accessible. So yeah, thanks for your time. Great, thanks so much, Lucky. We're going to move on to uh, Modern Energy Cooking Services, and Peter Peter Scott, founder and CEO of Burn Manufacturing, is going to talk a little bit about the the, the range of of modern energy uh, products that 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 Burn provides. Um, so take it away, Peter. Yeah, hi. Thanks so much. Great, uh, great to be here. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for the alliance for hosting this. And uh, you know, it's such a great time in the cook stove space. Great to see so many people has finding a success after so many years. I think I've been doing this since 1997. So I think I'm now like the Joe Biden uh, of, of cook stoves. So um, go Joe. And so, um, but very, uh, for sure, the best time for burn, the best time that I've seen in the cook stove space. So I just want to share a couple of new things that we're, that we're working on. Next slide. So a big day for us, actually, it's next week where we hit our 1 million units sold. Um, so actually in half of those we've sold in the last two years. So uh, yeah, Burn has just been uh, growing and building on its core business. And people sort of think of us as a biomass stove company, but what it, recently we've launched a number of new products like LPG, like electric pressure cooking, uh, some hybrid stoves and uh, institutional stoves. So uh, we'll look at those in more detail as we go. Uh, next slide. Great. So uh, Burn and now ECOA. So uh, actually we're uh, launching a rebrand outside of Kenya with the new ECOA uh, brand name, but uh, all of our products are made in Kenya for the world. So uh, we launched Sub-Saharan Africa's first and only modern cooking appliance manufacturing facility uh, back in, in 2014. Uh, since then we've grown to employ over 400 people, over 60% women. What's kind of unique about Burn is you know the entire team uh, is in Kenya. So all of our R&D uh, is done in Kenya in the same facility where we manufacture. And so that's a 25 person team. Our current capacity is 55,000 units growing to 90,000 by Q2. And the factory is even solar powered. So yeah, I think what Burn offers is very unique in the space because we're fully integrated from design all the way to B2C distribution. Last year, we launched a B2C platform 100,000 wood stoves uh, and executed um, uh, fully integrated carbon projects. Uh, and so, yeah, it's very, uh, very exciting for us to have built that and uh, yeah, ready for next steps. Next slide. So uh, one, of our, uh, one of our stoves that we've been uh, improving recently is our wood stove. And so that uh, we've actually pushed that to 51% efficient with the pot skirt. So, you know, when you think of a normal three stone fire, you're at something like maybe 13%. So we've really been pushing the bound of what's possible just with a natural draft stove. People often think you can't get to uh, tier three uh, and in some cases tier four without forced draft. And so we're really showing that's possible with, with this stove with also with a huge uh, net promoter score of uh, 90 uh, from our last 100,000 stoves that we, that we distributed. So very excited about rolling out this stove um, across Kenya and across the world, either with carbon or, or without carbon subsidy. Next slide. Uh, you know, of course, natural draft stoves can have some problems, especially with wet wood. So we sat down with Bill Gates and the Global Good team three years ago uh, and started designing a stove that could burn dry wood, wet wood, uh, or non-carbonized briquettes. And so that's what we've come up with, is a stove that was specifically designed for pay-as-you-go uh, solar. You can also use it with a grid connection, but it was designed for pay-as-you-go solar. Um, and that's tier four uh, with carbonized briquettes. And this is really a, a game changer. You know, when we've been looking at the space for, I mean, since Burn was founded in, in 2011, but uh, we were very excited about agricultural waste briquettes because you could burn them in a side feed uh, type stove as opposed to a top feed. So, and briquettes are actually, at least in Kenya, about half the price they are of pellets. So it's a renewable resource made from agricultural waste uh, and very low cost. And it can also burn wood. So as far as we know, there's really no, no other product like this. 
And um, shout out to Aprovecho and University of Washington and, and our team for getting the stove. And we've uh, been doing pilots for the last year and a half uh, with a number of pays you go solar companies and seeing great feedback. People are actually uh, willing to pay what the stove needs to sell for at retail. So that's a, I think that's a real game changer uh, in the space uh, for us and for the sector. Next slide. Then there's also um, a institutional version of that, which is um, had, we're seeing about savings of 70 US dollars per month. So it pays for itself in two months. And again, can burn either dry wood, wet wood or agricultural, agricultural waste. Um, next slide. Yeah. We've also launched a new, uh, the new ECOA brand for LPG, and we've been working on this for the last two years. And we've actually found that we can build a higher quality, lower cost product than what's coming out of China. So we've actually talked to a number of people that are on this call in terms of producing an LPG stove for them or a biogas stove for them. And I think they have to wrap their heads around this idea that you can actually make high quality, low cost products in Kenya and in Africa, you know, the cost of labor has gone up in China, um, so that we're, our cost of labor is now roughly half. So, you know, with the launch of the Africa Free Trade Agreement uh, and other trade agreements, we're very excited about rolling out these products across the whole continent. Next one. Next slide. Yeah. Uh, and last month we launched our, our first uh, ECOA electric pressure cooker. Um, so I think most people are familiar with electric pressure cooking here, but just if you're not, you know, it's five times cheaper than LPG, 78% cheaper than charcoal, you cook a meal for about 10 cents. Um, so this we feel like can be uh, a game changer in the space. Sorry, I keep saying the word game changer. I really am Joe Biden, I keep repeating myself. But um, so the, this I think is, there's a, a real potential for this for, uh, uh, especially for urban on-grid markets. So um, if people are interested in partnering with us, we have uh, units available for to uh, partner with with people to do um, to do pilots. So next slide. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, I think you know what's an interesting thing about electric pressure cooking is you know we talk about the time savings, but to say make a theory, which is a dish in Kenya, can take two and a half hours. You know, with, with an electric pressure cooker, maybe it's like maybe it's forty minutes, but it really is. You know, you press the button and walk away. So it actually is almost zero cooking time. So in terms of, uh, you know, gender and liberating, you know, men and women from the kitchen, the electric pressure cooker has the ability to do that. Next slide. So we're running a, a number of pilots right now. So we have two pilot, three pilots in Kenya, one in Tanzania um, and one in Uganda. So looking at willingness to pay, looking at some innovative financing, um, but really for us to kind of share more about this, I, you know, we'd rather have an NDA. <laughs> so I can, I just, this is just a little tease for people that like to know, know more about our work on this. Um, and then finally, just to say that you know, Burn is raising capital right now. So we're raising 7 million uh, split between uh, equity and debt. And so, yeah, we're actively both, you know, expanding our factory, expanding the, our product catalog and expanding across the continent. So yeah, looking forward to talking with people further. Oh, well, there was a Q&A question about pellets and briquettes. So just to clarify, I mean, I could just address that here. So pellets are usually uh, around 10 millimeters and are much more expensive to make. So a pellet can be six, eight, 10, 12 millimeters. Briquettes tend to be bigger and making a briquette is much uh, cheaper to do. It's lower capex, lower opex, and those, they tend to be bigger, 20, 25 millimeters. Uh, and up. So sorry, I just wanted to answer that one question. And I think that's it. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thanks so much, Peter. Uh, and so we're going to move on to the last category, uh, looking at improved biomass stoves. And we're going to start with uh, Ruben Walker. Uh, Ruben is the founder and CEO of uh, African Clean Energy. Uh, Ruben, over to you. Thanks a lot, Colm. Um, yeah. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Good to see some really uh, familiar faces, long time no see, and familiar names as well. Um, Ruben Walker, uh, CEO of African Clean Energy. Um, Colm, can you give me the next slide? Right, so we um, 
we manufacture and distribute the ACE-1, which is a hybrid household energy system seen here. Um, it's a hybrid in the sense that uh, we uh, collect solar energy, which charges a battery and that powers a ventilator that gives you a clean uh, biomass combustion. Um, and uh, in doing so, we can address both the thermal energy needs of a household as well as the electrical energy needs. And of course, while this adds some cost to the product up front, what actually makes it affordable for the vast majority of our customers is the fact that we are providing them with that basic electricity need. Um, I also think, you know, people who have spoken to me, I might have heard this point before, but I think this sector should actually grab back the term energy uh, from the sector that makes solar home systems and uh, talk about the fact that, you know, thermal energy tends to be roughly 95% plus of what households consume in terms of energy. Um, and that it's perfectly reasonable to expect that we can provide the basic electricity needs as well. And the fact that we do gives us a couple of really interesting advantages in that um, we can allow uh, the savings on both the thermal energy and the electrical energy to allow people to make monthly payments that are offset by their savings on their total energy bill. Um, and also given that we have a natural uh, fit with the, the user's mobile phone and preferably a smartphone, um, we've spent the past couple of years developing an Android integration, which gives us a number of uh, clever uh, um, new, new opportunities with uh, the user's smartphone. Um, those include a proprietary pay-as-you-go system, as well as a way of obtaining the usage data, which allows us to do a, a dynamic impact assessment on the usage of each individual unit and seeing how much influence is that user having on their health, the environment, poverty, gender equality, safety and security, etc. Colm, can I get another slide? So what we believe is in a, in a business case that um, initially provides the, the, the hardware. Uh, so our system, which would include a package with a smartphone. Um, and um, we very much agree with, uh, with Matthias, with the point that Matthias makes about the, the opportunities uh, from, for, for pelletizing fuel. Um, there's a very natural fit there. Uh, and while I agree with Peter as well that, that briquettes uh, in the early stages might be uh, more capex advantageous uh, in the very very long run uh, pellets do make a lot of sense uh, we intend to distribute the pellets to our users as well uh, and we can do so because we have uh, the ace connect smartphone app um, on which we will uh, be building a module that uh, allows users to um, to order pellets and either go and pick them up themselves or have them delivered um, we believe while some of our uh, Customers are very poor. We believe we can quantify some of the, uh, the impact uh, that they are having, uh, both obviously the, the, the most commoditized form of the impact being obviously carbon, but we can actually, at the hand of the available literature, look at a lot of the other advantages brought by uh, truly clean uh, energy solutions like this and start to uh, monetize those as well on behalf of the end user, thereby creating the access to liquidity to, to switch from what is essentially free fuel for many, many of the poorest rural people to purchased fuel, um, such as sustainably produced domestic uh, clean wood pellets. And of course, the access to the smartphone also offers a lot of other uh, potential for digital services. Colm, can I have the next? African Clean Energy, uh, we've been around since uh, 2011. Uh, we've sold 60,000 units that generated around uh, 5 million euros in revenue. Um, we've made some estimates based on the usage uh, and survey data that we, uh, that we have, uh, which gives some of the, the, the impact. Uh, but we feel we're very much at the early phase. Um, and uh, we have a number of very exciting partners, uh, as you can see back there, um, that we hope to scale up with in the coming years. Cool. Our footprint's pretty global. Um, so we, uh, I agree with Peter that manufacturing on the continent is the way to go. We have a factory uh, in Lesotho, which we've had since uh, 2012. Uh, and over uh, the course of uh, Q1 and 2 this year, we built a second factory in Cambodia, uh, which has already seen our uh, footprint there grow very, very rapidly, um, tripling sales uh, 
uh, between now and the beginning of the year. Uh, Uganda would have had an, uh, a factory, but unfortunately COVID uh, pushed that into 2021. So we hope to be able to get that up and running uh, very soon. The next one, cool. And uh, we are uh, currently raising uh, a round. We started that last month uh, and we're very interested in speaking to uh, anyone interested in this sector. This is a sector that has absolutely no way nowhere to go but up. We've got 3 billion people who need thermal energy. They are going to have it one way or another. And some of these companies in this session here are going to grow explosively in the next couple of years. So I really, really hope that we do get the investors on board. Thanks very much. Yeah, that's, that's all for me. Thanks so much, Ruben. Uh, and uh, last up, uh, but certainly not least, uh, we have Neha Juneja. Uh, Neha is the co-founder of Greenway Appliances. Uh, Neha, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you, Com, and good evening from Mumbai. Uh, my name is Neha, and I'm one of the co-founders of Greenway Appliances. We are India's largest manufacturer and distributor of biomass cook stoves, having recently launched in sub-Saharan Africa. And um, over the years, we've sold about 1.2 million stoves. And, uh, and of those, we've sold about a million uh, directly to consumers without the need for any carbon finance or any other form of subsidy support. So those sales have been market-based. And uh, I'm going to take my five minutes here to talk a little bit more, more about how that market can be expanded and how that expansion can be accelerated. Um, in India, those uh, about those million stoves sold have been uh, have been to consumers, rural consumers who fall within the top quintile of uh, household income, which basically goes on to say that they have some ability to pay. So these are not the poorest of the poor consumers within biomass uh, fuel users, which is one. But within those uh, about those million stoves, we've easily sold about half a million of those on some form of uh, microcredit, which is allowing mostly women who have been a part of a self-help group or so something similar for some time and allowing them to pay back for a $35 stove in six months or sometimes as long as 10 months or 11 months. And up until now, uh, this challenge or this capital requirement or this whole microcredit has been facilitated by a few microfinance enterprises that uh, exist in the country and are active. And uh, over the past couple of years, our intention has been to attract more capital. There's a lot of capital available for debt. There's a lot of capital available to, uh, what are, to facilitate what is known as priority sector lending. Uh, this capital available, but unfortunately, because of the ticket sizes and uh, you know just the spread of clean cooking loans, clean cook stoves loans, or, or other smaller ticket size loans, people just refrain from even doing the diligence to, you know, give out even a few loans. And um, just uh, to sort of uh, make sure that, or, or to work out that challenge, I'm going to just focus on that uh, in this presentation. Over the past couple of years, we've invested, uh, next slide please, quite, um, uh, a bit in technology, getting our own team, which now stands about at 110 people. And uh, using that uh, technology to facilitate everything from distribution to, of course, collection of data or what is known as the KYC documentation for facilitating microcredit. And doing that uh, using technology that makes things or even the provision of credit as fast as shopping online or doing something else online. So you just see a snapshot here of how we are managing deliveries um, at the moment. So we have an agent network of about 450 individuals who just go about and do demonstrations like the one that we saw in the last presentation. They do not have to take any risk of holding any inventory or making any investments towards uh, having some stoves at hand. They just book an order on our app and uh, we basically figure out a way like something like a DoorDash equivalent, but longer distances to fulfill that order from the nearest point, doing the delivery and thereafter the payment all by ourselves. And uh, over the last 18 months or so, we've sold about 190,000 stoves doing deliveries in a very DoorDash kind of way. 
And uh, this has also led to some considerable reduction in the delivery timelines, the cost, and of course, uh, more comfort with the sales agents to having not to invest in any inventory and just focus or the logistics and just focus on what they do best, which is going out and talking about stores. Uh, to the next uh, slide, please. The other thing that we've been working on, uh, you see a little paper, a snapshot of a paper here. So some years ago, we started by extending credit to consumers or our own books. And this is how the sales team would note down who's taken a loan on how many EMIs and how they've paid back uh, those installments. And uh, we've just progressed from something like that to now build a platform, a kind of a clearing house where we collect this data, the basic KYC data on our consumers who are interested in buying a stove, everything from the location to, you know, some their uh, national ID documentation, their, you know, existing um, credit relationships, which generally most consumers don't have aggregating similar consumers for similar risk profiles using uh, some very standardized algorithms that exist. So we've not really fortunately had to invest any R&D or effort on the risk scoring side. And then bundling those loans or bundling those borrowers essentially and matching them with lenders. Uh, we've recently made some investments in a captive uh, clearinghouse license, which allows us to uh, just basically bring on board these borrowers and match them with, uh, automatically make them eligible for matching them with banks, with licensed lending entities, and even individuals. So uh, India has fairly stringent uh, fintech regulations. So basically doing everything and scaling everything in a manner which uh, is allowed by regulation. We are right now running small pilots of this kind of an order booking system and uh, credit data collection in sub-Saharan Africa as well, uh, where fortunately the regulations make it easier to extend microcredit provided capital and uh, willing lenders are available. But I do want to say that for if we want to expand markets, uh, we need to tackle affordability. And this, uh, what I've just presented now is one of the ways to do that as the sector needs to grow. We need to have more specialized actors and types of capital come in. Capital that uh, is not only supporting enterprises, but capital that is supporting consumers as well. And there are many, many capital providers who would be interested in supporting consumers and of course, making some money off it too. Uh, the other and last takeaway I have is that uh, often in the sector, we tend to ignore that uh, if we want to sell millions of cook stoves or if we want to sell, you know, millions of tons of clean fuel, we need supply chains to manufacture those stoves or the supply chains to deliver those fuels. And uh, these investments often take, uh, take uh, ahead of the curve. These are ahead of the curve investments where you need to put in money 18 months, 24 months, even longer before you actually start seeing results. And a lot of investors, a lot of funders have a certain um, shyness, have a certain shyness from investing in CapEx heavy factories or physical points where fuel can be stocked. But if like any other industry, if there needs to be growth, there needs to be some investment in the supply chain because that is the most efficient and the most meaningful way of uh, bringing down cost, which is the other, which is another way of uh, tackling the issue of affordability. We cannot forget that our consumers are poor and that is uh, that is a very big elephant in the room, which even the best technology, best product and so on and so forth are not uh, enough alone to fight. We need ways to supplement the market power of the consumer. It's, it's a wonderful market. It's a wonderfully large market and it means some direct injection of support to to be able to scale further simply as a market. And uh, of course, for a large bunch of consumers, you still need subsidies, you still need other forms of support, but there is still there are still at least millions of households that have the ability to pay. They just need plans or support that works for them, that makes it easier for them to not have to pull out a large chunk of their monthly income to pay for a clean cooking solution. So I will end there. And uh, yes, that's the last slide. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Neha.
Um, so we have a couple of questions that uh, we're gonna we're gonna try and uh, answer uh, since since we have a little bit of time. Uh, but certainly would encourage uh, attendees to to submit more questions through the Q and A as we're as we're going through this. Uh, and we'll try to get to those, or uh, you know, raise your hand. Um, and and we'll see if we can if we can get to you uh, as well. But um, I've got a, a a couple of questions to start, and maybe um, just kind of taking a cue there from Neha in terms of um, uh, you know the the whole question about about subsidies and 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 um, you know some questions in the chat as well about um, how how uh, engagement in carbon programs uh, benefits the consumer. I think uh, uh, Esther. Um, from Sistema Bio, um, uh, you, you mentioned uh, some some um, uh, the way in which which carbon subsidies uh, are, are, are uh, benefiting the consumer. Do you want to do you want to say a little more about that? And, and maybe we'll we'll go to Peter uh, Peter Scott as well from Burn and and um, uh, but Esther, do you want to do you want to jump in on on that question about uh, how carbon uh, revenues benefit the consumer? Yes, yes, and I'm sure Greg from Coco has great insights to share as well. But uh, um, yes, I, I think the carbon credits was, um, yeah, ironically part of our very, very first business model in 2009 before the company had even started when it was really a key and core criteria to improve affordability uh, of biodigesters and after the, the market uh, collapsed is really when we moved to asset financing. So, so it's really something that we've considered from the very early days as being a, a crucial um, sort of systemic contribution to to improve the affordability of, of biodigesters and of biogas as a clean cooking fuel. Um, over the years, we've now been working on uh, the gold standard certification. We've been working on uh, on, on the voluntary markets, and we're expanding our, our carbon credit offering. Um, but, but basically, the, the first and foremost goal is really to uh, use this carbon credit as, as results-based financing to um, improve uh, the, the customer-facing price. Uh, so uh, really, we, we pass this revenue directly as a cost reduction uh, of the the, the overall price to the clients uh, to to um, basically look at our business model uh, as if it had two different revenue streams, one being directly from the farmers and the other one being from uh, results-based financing uh, in order to um, yeah, be able to, to cover our operational costs and make a, a small profit while keeping our product as affordable as possible. Uh, I think beyond carbon credits, we're also... I'm looking at other impact bonds uh, in in health, uh, in uh, women, um, women impact on women, women empowerment. So uh, we're working right now with the World Bank on a study that is um, is is really comparing the the, the health impact uh, of a baseline kitchen with a biogas kitchen to work towards that. So this is really clearly a very important. Um, um, Future revenue stream uh, for for us as a company, uh, and and which will ultimately benefit our clients uh, as well. So thank you. Great, thanks, Esther. Uh, Peter, do you want to do you want to jump in, and then maybe we can go to Greg? Sure. <clears throat> yeah, the only way you're going to get a high quality tier three stove to rural uh, households in sub-Saharan Africa is with a subsidy. So I just think like the idea that it's all going to be market based. I, I just don't think it is viable. So I think that the DFI donor world companies need to deal with how do we create subsidies, whether it's RBF or carbon, or they're a blend of the two. Like for example, there's some projects where it's like you can take carbon subsidy or RBF, but not both. So it needs to really be an all of the above solution to bring that subsidy. And then to the question of how does the carbon subsidy benefit those consumers? I mean, they wouldn't get, they wouldn't have access to the stove with a, a carbon subsidy. So like with our wood stove, our Kuniokoa, it goes from $40 down to say $8. So, I mean, the benefit is allows them to access a product that they would never access without, without uh, carbon. Those are the, I think the two, two key points. Greg, anything further to add on that one? Yeah, I'd, I'd sort of echo um, 
Peter's comments. I think, uh, although I don't like the words, because um, it's it, you know it's it's a it's a turn off to some folks. Um, I think of it as bundling. You know, we're in the fuels business, and uh, and so we we sell three products. We sell a stove, we sell fuel, and we sell a regulatory commodity. Um, and and uh, and so we have customers that are power plants in in Korea, for example, um, and we have customers that are that are consumers in uh, you know in in uh, uh, in Kenya, um, but so we we look at the we look at the revenue streams and we look at we look at the, um, the 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 practice of bundling in order to enable consumers who are super price sensitive to you know access lower prices. Um, you know, in, in a lot of in a lot of venture back technology companies, they they use uh, equity to provide consumer discounts. Um, you know, that's the the sort of the Silicon Valley Valley model that that, that is, is a little bit questionable, particularly if you're doing stuff in Africa. Um, so instead, we, we we provide those consumer discounts um, through through carbon through the sale of the regulatory commodities, and uh, and yeah, we we're, we're pretty aggressive about it because we believe that uh, ultimately uh, you know, it's commercially sensible, it impact maximizes, and uh, and and the carbon rights start with the uh, with with the end consumer. Right. So it's a, you know it is a fair trade um, to enable them to get something that would otherwise be sort of what a two burner LPG solution in the market is. It's about a you know all in with it's about a hundred hundred and twenty dollars uh, in 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 this market to 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 you know the upfront cost cash out of pocket. Um, that's what this thing um, you know if there was. You know, we've, we've done things, we, we built our factory in-house in order to remove a manufacturing margin. We do direct distribution to remove distribution margin. We have a direct retail, remove retail margin. So we, we think about the consumer, about driving down the consumer price uh, with lots of different methods um, because ultimately that, 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 that generates greater fuel sales and generates greater credits. And so it's a sort of a sensible flywheel. But, but yeah, it's, it, is a, it is a key part of the model, always has been. Um, I share your enthusiasm, Peter, with the Biden win because I think it has a direct and relevant impact on our business in terms of the prospects for getting a really, you know, really uh, strong deal out of uh, uh, Glasgow COP next year, um, which ultimately will, you know, will, 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 I think, translate into a, you know, into a much higher price in in in, uh, in compliance markets, some of which uh, already uh, exist. But but yeah, it has to, to, to Esther's point, it's been a long road for all of the carbon folks over the sort of the 2012 to, to 2018 period um, who have been uh, uh, trying to build uh, businesses that, that, that deliver emissions reductions but but with 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 low pricing I think that's all uh, fundamentally changing now there is a there's a bit of a mega trend that's dif difficult to put back in the bottle with uh, with what's going on in the dynamics in the market at present thanks Greg sticking with um, <laughs> The, the, the topic of carbon um, is, a, is a robust discussion yesterday about, about um, uh, the, the, the limitations of integrating um, carbon financing uh, in, in the biogas space. VJ, you um, uh, talked a little bit about, about some of the work that you're doing uh, to integrate the smart biogas platform with, uh, with carbon markets. Do you want to talk a little bit more about uh, the, the limitations you see uh, with the existing methodologies and, and how you guys are thinking about uh, addressing those? Sure. Um, unfortunately, I did miss that session yesterday, so I can't speak to that directly. But the what we're trying to do is um, is is be more accurate. Um, the the at the moment, the way that this works in general, and I know that some companies have their own um, systems with gold standard and whatnot. But generally, you have to go out and you have to survey a sample, an agreed sample um, of biogas digesters. Um, on an annual basis, let's say, which means that that's a manual process. It's also um, because of the nature of it being a sampling exercise, it's not entirely accurate. And as I showed in, in my presentation, we're also finding that, and we knew we would find that biogas digesters vent methane, <clears throat> especially at nighttime. And these, this just means that the whole exercise is not not actually accurate. And that's really important if you care about clean cooking. It's beyond uh, revenue source. This is about, about uh, emissions as well. So what we're trying to do is use our uh, uh, real measurements as part of this process. And we're working directly with uh, Clean Development Mechanism and Gold Standard both to integrate the smart, smart biogas 
system into their process. One of these, and I don't remember which one it is, unfortunately, already allows smart metering, but the other one doesn't. So we're having to do that from, from the start. Uh, but luckily, there is a window of opportunity over the next six to eight months to do this. So hopefully, uh, by May next year, we, we will be integrated into both of those processes. Great, thank you. Um, another question that, that came up in the chat was, uh, um, and, and Peter, you addressed addressed this a little bit, um, the difference between pallets and briquettes. I want to I want to bring Matthias in, uh, maybe to talk a little bit about um, the 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 pallet side of things, and maybe talk talk about the the you know what what does manufacturing pallets at scale look like, and and then we may be go over to Carlo to talk about carbonized briquettes and uh, and some of the uh, the attributes of, of briquettes and and what uh, production at scale looks like there. Yes, hi, yeah, so uh, production of pellets, um, it's a multi-step process. Uh, you need the raw material and, and then you process it. You, In our case, we collect uh, branches from forestry plantations. So we actually outsource that, we get it delivered to the factory gate and, and buy it per ton. And then we chip it with a wood chipper, we hammer mill it, um, and then we press it into pellets. Uh, and it's it's a relatively low energy uh, uh, input in terms of the value of the pellets because people often say you know is it worth it? Uh, uh, yes, absolutely, um, it is. Uh, and um, there are many steps. And um, uh, when everything is working great, um, pellets come out you know really nice and hard and everything. Uh, but there are many things that could go wrong. For example, the raw material could have um, different. Uh, the wrong moisture content it's very important it has to be very exact it could be um, aged too much or it could have contaminants like sand and things so um, making pellets in a, a perfect um, setup in europe or north america will be very different from making it in um, in our context where um, also even electricity can vary a lot uh, the quality and availability of it uh, and uh, at, we've had a lot of uh, had to repair our machines a lot because at one point we had about five power cuts a day and to have a these are big machines you know to have a backup solution would be uh, you know you know very expensive comparatively to the rest so there are things like that that um, you never have to worry about uh, uh, in in a in a industrialized country, um, so but uh, and um, the scale that um, you know that they the studies show is like uh, when you get to the five to ten ton an hour scale, that's when the um, cost come down uh, very much. Uh, uh, and um, we're not at that scale yet, you know, but uh, we're getting closer to it. Uh, you know, uh, two and a half tons an hour, um, but. Uh, uh, you know, but it's very clear to us that, um, you know, things like labor costs uh, are almost the same, um, whether you, you know, running um, a smaller tonnage or a larger. So uh, and that's why I talked a lot about utility uh, in my presentation, because I think it's, it's, it's important for anyone in this sector to think that, you know, we are such an early stage with, with many of these things, it's especially the pellet sector is like in, although we've been doing this for a long time, when we started, there weren't even stoves available. We had to make our own stoves. Uh, and um, so it's at such an early stage uh, with the technology, uh, with the experience of making pellets, and also very, very little capital has gone um, to this subsector. Um, and uh, we cannot, uh, we, we have to really uh, learn a lot more about it. And I think we are going to publish some studies with uh, Clean Cooking Alliance on the production cost of, of pellets. We are doing a, a project now with, with you and, and that will be become public knowledge. We're going to really show the, uh, you know, all the input costs and everything. And, and we, we try to help the sector in, in that way. Okay, thanks, Matthias. Maybe uh, Carlo, do you want to do you want to come in and talk a little bit about the process for for manufacturing briquettes at scale? Yes, thank you, Colm. Uh, so, just uh, a few words uh, first about uh, what are briquettes, uh, charcoal briquettes, char briquettes, because there's like the fresh biomass and charred biomass briquettes. We produce at Otago our charred biomass briquettes, and these are um, alternative to charcoal. 
And uh, before somebody actually me, I was, was saying we cannot serve all uh, the population with a product, uh, like either because they're too poor, but also because uh, some people, they just uh, in their culture like to use charcoal. And uh, for example, um, I believe a lot of us have been at the airport in uh, Ethiopia and uh, uh, at Addis, and you can see that you can get traditional coffee and they cook it inside the airport on charcoal. So what we are providing with char briquettes is an alternative to uh, everyone that wants to use charcoal either for economic reason or cultural reason. And it would be great if we could uh, uh, substitute all charcoal uh, used in the world with something like that. To produce something like that is actually quite hard, I have to say. So it's uh, uh, not so encouraging in the sense that it's very easy to make a, a charcoal briquette. A char briquette is very easy to make a good quality and affordable char briquettes. It's really, really hard. And we have been working in this in, uh, for the last 10 years. We are manufacturing and we have talked today a lot about manufacturing. We are an industrial manufacturing plant here in Cambodia. And we're so good at it that actually this year uh, we were supposed to start building factories, the, our first factories out, outside Cambodia. Unfortunately, COVID has not allowed us that. But for anyone that is interested um, next year, we are offering the service to build a factory that can produce thousands of tons of briquettes. As I said, because also another point is uh, small scale uh, production is not uh, economically viable. So uh, yeah, at Otago, we are very good in building factories that produce good quality chabriquettes. Great, thanks, Carlo. You mentioned COVID there. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about, uh, I mean, your, your, your presentation focused on uh, street food vendors, on, on, on restaurants. Uh, I'm really curious to, to understand how that uh market has been impacted by COVID and what you guys have done to to adapt your distribution model to to some of the public health restrictions yeah actually i was talking as you say about um uh, street food vendors and they were the worst hit and restaurant of course by COVID. Uh, just imagine for example the closure of the closure of schools has a uh, put out of business all street food vendors that were uh, selling food in front of schools, all street food vendors that were working at night in front of inter in entertainment facilities like clubs or like karaoke, which here in Asia are the main attraction. So it was very hard. Our sales dropped in one month uh, over 70%. So I mean, we were selling uh, around 25% of our usual sales figures. And uh, what we did, we uh, went online first for marketing and uh, also in distribution. And we started here in Cambodia. There's a lot of uh, delivery apps are getting very popular. And so we started offering uh, uh, delivery like home delivery uh, through these delivery apps uh, directly to households. So, but uh, as I said, uh, they, they, we hope that as soon as COVID actually now here in Cambodia situation is much better. So I, uh, schools have opened again and street food vendors are working again, but that was really, really hard for a few months. Uh, practically our market was wiped out. And sadly for the people that had no livelihood uh, also because of that. Great, thank you. Uh, another question uh, in the chat. Um, for the folks doing biogas, so so maybe Esther and and, and Lockie, if you want to weigh in on this, um, have you seen demand for the use of of heat for drying uh, crops, clothes, dehydrating food uh, instead of cooking, or other other non cooking productive uses of of, of biogas uh, be, being bundled as additional uh, potentially different additional sources of revenue uh, for biogas systems. It's a great question. Uh, I'll, I'll start and then I'll let Lucky uh, add if he, if he wants to. Um, at, at Sistema Bio, I think we really started out with uh, the smaller biodigester to serve um, uh, subsistence to small farmers. And we've progressively um, expanded, grown our products to, to serve uh, larger farms, which can produce uh, above like five or six cubic meters of, of biogas per day, which is much more than what you need for cooking. 
Um, so we started to develop first um, thermal appliances such as larger industrial burners where you can heat um, 50 to 100 liter um, pots either for, for cleaning the cow shed or, or um, milk production, uh, sorry, cheese production if you want to heat uh, milk. Um, and then we've launched uh, our water heater, which is a, an LPG adapted water heater that can run with biogas. And um, so it's actually a dual use. You can keep it for LPG or you can switch it to, to biogas um, when, you, when you have enough. So this can be connected to showers or also if you add, um, if you combine three of those water heaters, uh, you can actually build a milk pasteurizing unit. Uh, so this really increases the revenue uh, for our dairy farmers who are clients because they can pasteurize their milk on site with energy that is um, free once they've paid their loan. Um, we also provide um, uh, chicken brooders, uh, so to keep the, the little chicks warm, uh, and same for piglets, uh, which is uh, used either with electricity or charcoal uh, when there is no biogas solution available. Um, and and th those are sort of the thermal uses, which are the most effective from an energy usage perspective because biogas is a thermal energy. Um, um, we're also then the second step is basically to convert the biogas into mechanical energy uh, through gasoline adapted engines, um, which um, we're also doing. So we're running uh, small sort of Honda engines um, with a few horsepower to run water pumps uh, or to the chaff cutters that are the machines that cut the, the nipia grass, which is cow feed. Uh, into it shreds it into smaller pieces. So this is um, typically in, in slightly in farms that have more than five cows. Um, they they use either a gasoline powered one, a manual one, or an electricity powered one. So we can replace um, this one, and then we're working on a few more which are still in in R and D phase. So uh, stay tuned uh, for more. Uh, and yes, about uh, fruit drying, this is something um, we've. Uh, received requests for, um, we're looking at it, but, but still from a, a very much of an R&D perspective. So happy to talk more uh, if there's a pilot that needs to, to be developed. Okay. Thanks, Esther. Lucky, you want to you wanna jump in on this one? Yeah, so um, I mean, in Cambodia in, well, and Bangladesh, our units are, are quite small scale. So they're really designed at small scale farmers just for cooking requirements. Um, in saying that though, there, there isn't really a huge dairy uh, market in Cambodia. So I know um, Esther just mentioned and, and having spoken with some of their colleagues, I know uh, a lot of their um, medium scale biodigesters are using dairy farms to, um, and the gas is used for some of the, the milk production. Um, so now having started in Bangladesh, I expect that to be more of a uh, interest for some of our customers. Um, so yeah, it will be interesting to maybe chat with Systema about uh, how they're using using that gas for for the dairy requirements because dairy in Bangladesh is is quite a uh, you know, bigger market than than Cambodia. Um, in Cambodia, we see some customers use excess gas for cooking their pig feed. Um, so some customers even buy multiple biodigesters biodigesters to get um, uh, excess gas so they have enough to cook with their pig feed. Um, but I think I'll link it in back to what um, BJ said with the excess gas that is produced and invented. It's really important um, what we've found or what we've seen it to, to find a way to use that excess gas. So particularly with the medium scale units say that um, Systema use, I think the um, appliances that they've found to use that excess gas is, uh, is really good um, because if if the gas isn't used and obviously it vents to the atmosphere, which isn't great. So um, yeah, having having a, an additional use for that gas, be it through dairy or water heating or um, electricity, um, I think is really important to, to try and utilize um, all of the gas that is produced in a biodigester for, um, you know, a use of some sort to make sure it's at least burnt um, to stop it venting. Yeah, fantastic, really great point. Um, 
Great. Well, I, th I think we're 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 out of time. Uh, thanks so much to to all of the presenters. We managed to pack a lot into uh, a, a very short amount of time. So we'll wrap up, and uh, we're going to see everyone back here in in thirty minutes uh, for the next panel discussion. That's going to be focused on uh, the household value proposition and accelerating consumer demand uh, for clean cooking solutions. So thanks everyone, and we'll see you again shortly. <laughs>